Jennifer, in trying to understand the uh, broad concept of deception and starting in animals, you've worked extensively with cephalopods, octopus, squid, cuttlefish. Uh, let me understand the, the behavioral um, uh, observations that you've made, and then together we can decide, do we want to uh, infer into that uh, deception? Fair enough, <laughs> yep. Well, octopuses, because they have no sort of physical protection, they actually have to live by their wits. And uh -huh. one of the ways they live by their wits is they have this fabulous appearance system. So they have pigment sacs called chromatophores in all their skin. And they have, they're actually elastic sacs so that muscles can pull them out and there's nerves directly to each muscle. What that means is they have very, very tight control, three different colors too. Mm. So they can change their appearance in milliseconds no, and they second. can change it on millimeters. Wow, wow. Okay, square millimeters. Wow. So the result is that specifically when they're out hunting, when they're very vulnerable, they can simply look like the background and they can change so quickly. So they go from on the top of a rock to underneath in the shade and immediately they darken. Mm. They're wonderful to watch. Mm. How, how does that mechanism occur? I mean, they're obviously seeing the in their eye. I mean, has that been traced neuroanatomically? Yes, they are seeing in the sense that they're picking up the appearance of everything around them. Right. And then they're sending the information to very big optic globes, which are immediately below the eyes. Okay. And there seems to be some control of the patterning in the optic globes. And then there's three different neural centers in the brain. And then it goes immediately out all the way to this two-dimensional surface of the skin. Right. But what's interesting about it is we don't think that they're actually self-monitoring. So they produce this fabulous appearance match to wherever they are, but we think they're not monitoring themselves. Well, certainly at that speed, it, it, it would seem impossible to self-monitor, even if you could. <laughs> well, but interestingly enough, they're colorblind. Oh. And they have color patterns. So what they're doing is they're producing something which is fit for the eyes of vertebrates, specifically fish so that they won't be seen by them. But they're not self-monitoring because they're very much, at least, because they're not picking it up because they haven't the receiving potential. Um, but, but they're able to match their environment. That's it, correct. And so how, how is that happening? If they're not able to perceive, uh, are they just matching the, the degree of uh, saturation? Or, or, or is the... Is the uh, perception of color that they match their body kind of at a, at a lower level that, that they're not, that, that, that they, they wouldn't behaviorally react to it. So you, we say they're colorblind, but it's sort of like a blind sight. Is that what's happening? No, not really. Um, they really must be picking up black white very, very sensitively. Uh -huh. And yet how they decide which of the chromatophore colors they should put on and off, that's a little bit of a mystery to us. Oh, that's it. Because if you can't see them, how can you make them? R right. Well, when you say you can't see them, I'm just pressing here a little bit. Yep. Like, you know, the, the phenomenon of blindsight where people are, say that I can't see anything, but that they have a 90% accuracy because they're, they're seeing something on a, on a non-conscious level. Right. And is it possible that octopus could, when, we, when you say that they are, uh, they're colorblind, they can only see degrees of black and white, that's because we've tested them in terms of their reactions. That's, that's right. the only way we can know it, yep. <laughs> obviously. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not some sub-level that's occurring that they can match colors that they can't behaviorally react to in a, in a proactive way. Is that possible? <laughs> No, it's a little bit different in humans with blind sight because we actually have several different circuits in the brain. Right. And there's a circuit that we're conscious of. Right. And there's a circuit that we're not conscious of. And the one that we're not conscious of we can do, be functioning when there's damage to, exactly, the, to the exactly. first one. Right. And But you're saying that there's nothing... So, no, it, there's not. that's not happening with octopuses. Okay. So what you're saying is that they really are only seeing degrees of black and white but are reacting with a, a three-color chromatic palette. Yes, though they are seeing the plane of polarization of light, which we can't see. 
uh-huh. and we don't actually know as much about it as we should because we haven't really studied it. But 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 let's agree that the the output that they have is pretty good. In other words, they do match their circuit. The output is very very good. I, yeah. In fact, I've been doing a little study back home looking at um, undergraduate students' perceptions of octopus and camouflage, uh-huh, uh-huh. and they're finding it difficult, which I would have expected. They're finding it difficult to to, to recognize the octopus from as the an background. octopus. Yeah, oh, that, yeah. That's pretty. Uh, they're really, really good. You yeah. have to see them. And, and it's a color matching? And it's a color matching. Uh, so. You can, someone has played with cuttlefish, given them backgrounds in the lab which mm-hmm. don't match in color, but do match in brightness. Yes, yes, yes. And then they can fool them. And then... And, then they and they, they, so they can have them generating patterns which are not the same as the background in color. Oh. We don't know enough about that. But that sounds like that they are perceiving color then. Not in enough. some way, no? There's only one cephalopod that perceives color. It's, it's actually an open ocean squid called Watasenia scintillans. Oh, okay. And they have red, I haven't met one. <laughs> I haven't either. I'd love to. <laughs> they have red, white, and blue photophores. Oh. And red, white, and blue color perception. Oh, okay. But the octopus doesn't. It's a bit of a mystery to us. So, so they match beautifully. But, but don't they have don't, the capabilities but, to, to see the yeah. color. Yeah. Part of it, I think, is that if you get below about six feet deep, oh. a lot of the color in the water is filtered out. All the reds are gone. Oh, that makes sense. Sure. And so brightness has a big deal to do with it. But sure. honestly, it really works. It really works. So, so that's fascinating. So, I mean, look, so camouflage, they are superb at. That's right. Um, clearly, this is not a, a, a conscious deception. I mean, that that's have several orders of magnitude Im- implying different things for the octopus. But I think in terms of understanding deception in its broader sense, uh, camouflage certainly is, uh, you know, worthy of, of, of inclusion. Oh, yes. But you wouldn't say it was conscious no, in any no. way. No, that's a whole other kind of question. But- it's semi-automatic, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, right, right. I mean, it's not like uh, a stick insect, because a stick insect, of course, looks like a stick, not an insect. Right. And so you could call that deception. Right, sure, sure. Uh, on the other hand, the insect doesn't know anything about it, the fact that it's deceiving and it doesn't change. It just looks like it looks like. Right, right, right. So, so the octopus is one step above that. Right, right, right. And the, no question, with the, with it's the, very dynamic. You, in both cases, it was selected by evolution, but in the insect, it's just that way all the time. That's right. That's way. It, that's the why it has it has been selected to be that way. With the octopus, it has been selected to have the capabilities because it has to it has to have different. Uh, it, it has to change. That's right. If it was only perfect for under a rock, then it could never leave under a rock. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, it must be the case that um, they're being selected all the time. Mm-hmm. So if you look at most of the octopus species, they have tens of thousands of eggs. Okay. Oh. And it's true that the young float off in the plankton as paralarvae. And so there's not that many that settle on the bottom. On the other hand, if you figure the evolutionary situation that if we don't have lots and lots of octopuses, so they must get selected out. So as young animals crawling around on the bottom, they get eaten by everything that can eat them. Mm-hmm. And so they must get very, very heavily selected. This competence must have been just absolutely shaped incredibly quickly and incredibly. Oh. So in, in, a, in a brood, uh, you say tens of thousands of, uh, in a, what, what is an octopus lifetime, roughly? About a year. About a year. <clears throat> so, That's another thing that we find very interesting, uh-huh. that um, they learn very much. They are very, very adapt- adaptable, very flexible, and learn every way possible. Mm. And yet they're mm. not doing it like the elephant, for instance, which is living for decades right. and needs to remember for decades. Yeah. The octopus <clears throat> is dead in a year, a year and a half, and yet it's still got this strong evolutionary push to learn everything in sight. Mm. And how many um, e- eggs would it, it hatch in a, in, in, during that year? Oh, it doesn't work that way. They're what we call semiparous, which means that they end their lifetime at reproduction. Oh, okay. So they'll grow, feed, accumulate muscle, um, and then mature, have a very short season 
of mating and reproduction and die. And, and, how, and so how many offspring do they have when they die? Well, it depends on the octopus because, sure. I mean, one species that I used to study, a little guy oh. that was called pygmy octopus, had about 100 eggs. Uh -huh. But most of them have tens or thousands. And, and, and they're, they, they, they're laid or spawned? Or? The female lays eggs and tends them for octopuses. Uh -huh. um, but with the squid, they spawn them and they die. Uh -huh. And they're either hidden or there's some kind of repellent on the egg string so that predators don't eat them. So it, it's... Um, but if, you, if you're turning them over once a year and there are tens of thousands, that does give evolution a lot of, a lot of ammunition sure. yes. to, to work quickly. One of my colleagues described the motto of the cephalopods as live fast, die young. Mm. <laughs> and if you think about it, it's probably because they evolved in competition with the bony fish. Oh. And the bony fish have a completely different strategy in that they live a long time and they re reproduce several times in their lifespan. Mm. So by the time a fish is even grown enough to reproduce, the octopus is reproduced three or four times. It's, in some ways, is ahead of the game. Mm. In terms of, uh, so the, the, the things that seems to be selective is this incredible um, camouflage technique. Uh, you've described the different the different the sequence of steps that an octopus would go through in a defensive thing. Could you could you go through those steps? Yes. Well, if you like to look at it this way, you know, stay in hiding. Nothing can get you. If you have to come out, then make sure nobody can recognize you. If somebody gets too close, like a fish coming zooming in, then you go in a startle pattern so mm. that it gets disconcerted. And then you can just jet pulse yourself away and put up a smoke screen between you and that animal. Mm. And then it's all part of not getting eaten. It's a <laughs> big part of not getting eaten. 